Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Waterfowl Identification. Uh, this is put on by the Illinois Learn to Hunt program. Uh, this has been a pretty well received uh, webinar we've been putting on. Uh, we've been getting a mix of hunters and bird watchers through this, and uh, it's been really fun, actually. So, uh, uh, welcome to everybody. Just a few things to uh, get started. Uh, you do not need your video tonight, you do not need your microphones tonight. So, just sit back and relax and enjoy the information that Dan's going to give us tonight. And then uh, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, uh, there is a chat function in Zoom. So if you click on the chat, uh, you can uh, put your question in there. We will have time at the end for a question and answer session. So if uh, we don't get to your question during the webinar, we can answer it at the end. Uh, and then um, just so you know, we will be sending out a survey uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, and uh, you can then uh, fill out the survey and give us any tips on if you enjoyed this or if you have anything else that you'd like included in it. And then we can make those changes in the future. Uh, with that, um, also, we are, there are some uh, tests that are going to be popping up throughout. So make sure you're paying attention. We'll have some quick quizzes and polls that will pop up to ask you guys questions. So make sure you're paying attention. So hopefully that will be fun for you guys. So going over what we're going to cover tonight, uh, we're going to first start with uh, this, the, how hunters are conservationists and how uh, funding towards hunting and the duck stamp goes towards um, preserving uh, wildlife. And then we're going to talk about uh, wet, uh, waterfowl ecology and then the differences between dabbling ducks and diving ducks. And then go over the different duck species that are found in Illinois and then also the different goose species that are found in Illinois and then different traits that help tell them apart. Uh, our presenter tonight, our main presenter is going to be Dan. Dan, if you'd like to say hi real quick. Hello, everybody. Thank you. And then Adam's going to chime in too. Adam, you want to say hi? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Great. And then I'm Jason Buckley, and I'll be doing the intro and outro. So with that, we can get started. So Dan, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Jason. Um, like Jason mentioned, we always like to, to start off these conversations with a quick discussion on kind of the, the relevancy of hunting uh, to a sort of a modern society. Um, and one thing we really like to highlight is the, basically the funding and the economic impact of hunting. Um, and now the federal duck stamp, which we're going to discuss here, is just a small subset of how hunters, you know, give economic contributions to wildlife and to conservation. Um, in addition to the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act, as well as uh, purchasing license sales and different stamps. Um, but the federal duck stamp was initiated in 1934 by President Franklin Roosevelt. And the, the interesting thing about the duck stamp is that 98% of the cost of the duck stamp goes directly to acquire and protect wetland habitat. Um, so if you look at some other funding mechanisms, this is by far um, the, the highest percentage that directly benefits wildlife. Um, and it is required for anybody to hunt uh, migratory birds um, in the United States, um, as well as, you know, in recent years, we've seen kind of a huge trend in people just purchasing these stamps for the, the sole fact of giving back to conservation. But with that kind of, that kind of uh, quick discussion out of the way, now we're going to really transition to kind of the, the meat and bones of this presentation. And that's, again, identifying waterfowl. Uh, but first, it's kind of important to understand why it's important to, to know, you know, what waterfowl you're looking at. Um, obviously, it's important to know what your target is before you're shooting. Uh, but more specifically, if you look at the bag limits um, that the state and the federal government basically set for waterfowl, you can see that it's very specific in regards to a certain number of species that you may harvest, or in some cases, a certain number of a gender of a species. And so if you don't have the ability to be able to identify the waterfowl, um, then it's really difficult to make sure that you stay within that legal bag limit. And so that's, that's why this is really important, is to make sure that you stay within that, that legal bag limit guidance um, set by the, the state and the federal government. And so we're going to start off this conversation talking about ducks. And if one of the easiest ways to, to think about duck ecology and think about duck ID is to, to break ducks into a couple different groups. 
Um, and this is fairly consistent across the board, uh, but essentially you have two groups. You have the dabblers, um, some people will call those puddle ducks, and you also have the divers or the diving ducks. Um, you can see this picture of a mallard on the left. That is a textbook dabbler or puddle duck. And on the right, we have a scop, which is a textbook diving duck. And there are a few differences that are kind of important to know between dabblers and diving ducks. Um, dabbling ducks are those ducks that essentially prefer to live in or prefer to feed in shallower wetland areas. Um, they typically, they do have the ability to swim completely underwater, uh, but they don't utilize that ability very often. Uh, most often they're going to be um, surface feeding. So they're going to be feeding on seeds and insects that are kind of just below the surface of the water. Um, they also have a bigger wing to body size ratio than diving ducks. Um, Jason, if we could go back one slide just for a second. Um, and if you look at these two pictures, you can see that, that kind of drastic difference in wing size to body ratio. You can see the, ma the male mallard on the left, which is a dabbler, has a much larger wing to body ratio than the male scop that's on the right, which is a diving duck. It has a much um, smaller wing to body ratio. Another thing that's important to remember about dabbling ducks is that they have the ability to take off directly from the water. Um, so if you can see in this picture of this mallard here, he's essentially just going from a dead still sit on the water to in flight. Um, now, if we start looking at diving ducks, they actually have to get a running start before they can take off from the water. And so being able to see a duck at a distance and kind of easily you know, determine whether it's a dabbling duck or a diving duck can really start to give you guidance to what that specific species might be. Because um, if, if you're 100% certain that it's a diving duck, um, then you can basically eliminate all the dabbling ducks from your list and you're only less, left with about half the species to, to try to run, run through and figure out if that's a, a, a possible ID. Um, so it's, it's really useful to be able to quickly pinpoint dabbling duck versus diving duck. So here's kind of a, a quick picture that, that really illustrates that, that term dabbling. Um, so essentially this is, a, again, a male mallard, and he is actively dabbling. And so when we use the term dabbling, um, this is kind of what we're referring to. Um, so they're just basically tilting their body underwater. They're keeping their butt above water and basically just eating any vegetation that they can reach. Um, so they're not completely diving underneath the water. They're staying right at that, that surface. And that's why you're gonna find these specific birds more often in shallower wetland areas than some of the bigger, deeper bodies of water. And so in comparison, we have the diving ducks. Um, and you can see in this, this picture here, this is a uh, common golden eye. Um, and you can see that this male is essentially taking a running start to get off the water. He does not have the ability like the dabblers to basically take off straight from the water. Um, so the diving ducks, their feet are actually set a little bit further back in the body and that is basically advantageous for better swimming. Um, so they're stronger swimmers, but it creates this, you know, lack of being able to just take off completely from the water. Now with those legs set a little further back, they're also not as adapted to dry areas. Um, so they don't have the the ability to walk on dry land as much as the dabblers. You're still often going to find them feeding in dry fields and things, uh, but more commonly that will be um, your, your dabblers. So diving ducks, again, um, they're going to dive for their food. So they're going to be completely submerged underwater. Um, they're primarily feeding on fish, invertebrates, and other deep water plants. And here's a couple examples of diving ducks. And so you can see that they're basically completely submerged underneath the water, feeding on these really deep water seeds and invertebrates. And one of the primary food sources, uh, if we have any fly fishermen in here, you may be familiar with this. This is what's commonly referred to as a scud. Um, and many fly fishermen use scud-like baits or scud-like flies. Um, to, to catch trout, but this is essentially what a lot of those diving ducks are feeding on underneath the water. Um, there's dozens of dozens of different species of scud in Illinois, 
uh, but essentially this is some of those deep water invertebrates that they're actively feeding on. So now we're gonna really kind of wrap up again with dabblers and divers. Um, before we, we really start to analyzing individual species and looking at how to identify them, where they're gonna be found and, and things like this, I just wanna reiterate the, the importance of being able to distinguish a duck between a dabbler and a diver. Um, not only in some of the morphological changes, the morphological differences between the birds, um, like their wing to body size ratio, the way their feet sit back, but also just the, the basic ecology of the species. Um, so where these birds are likely gonna be found. Um, so again, your dabblers are gonna be in shallower areas where your divers are gonna be on bigger, big bodies of lakes, big reservoirs, big rivers, and things like that. And so as you begin to, to start hunting a, a specific site, you're really gonna be able to pinpoint what birds are likely to come into this area. And again, that's a really useful strategy to start eliminating species that, you know, that it might be. And so you can really maybe come down to two or three instead of starting with 15 species that that specific duck might be, you can really start to narrow that list down. And this is uh, kind of a, a, another head on um, shot. We have a male mallard on the left and a pair of redheads on the right. Um, and one of the, the big things I want to point out here is a few terms that you're likely going to hear me use kind of throughout this presentation. Um, so the term cupped up, um, that's a very common term by waterfowl hunters as well as biologists and, and birders alike. Um, so this term cupped up is essentially what this mallard is, is kind of doing right now. So you can see he kind of locks his wings as he's getting ready to, to land. And so pretty soon he's going to start to basically stick out his feet, stick out his landing gear and prepare for a landing. And so you'll hear me use this term cupped up or locked up. And that's essentially this behavior that that's referring to. So if you hear me use that throughout the presentation, again, you can just kind of paint this picture of, you know, a mallard cupped up, basically coming right at you, getting ready to land. A few other terms that you're gonna hear me use throughout um, the bill. Obviously, most people are familiar with the bill. Um, the breast is going to be the chest feathers on the bird. The wing speculum, um, I will use this just about every slide from here on out, this term wing speculum. Um, essentially, it is a showy patch of feathers um, on the wing. Um, and now, obviously, this duck is not in flight, so those are kind of tucked away. Uh, but a lot of times, even though that bird's not in flight, you can still see um, some of that speculum there. And then last but not least, we have the primaries or the wing flight feathers. So now we're really gonna start diving into to different species. Um, so first we're gonna start off with the dabbling ducks. Um, so here's a list of, of kind of the most eight common dabbling ducks we have in Illinois. Um, the top four um, highlighted in yellow are the highest number, basically the most duck shot per year are of these species. Um, mallard is the number one harvested duck in Illinois, followed closely by the wood duck, the gadwall, and then the green winged teal. Then we also have the blue winged teal, the northern shoveler, the American widgeon, and the northern pintail. And so now we're going to really start getting into identification strategies as well as kind of a, a species overview. Um, and we're going to start off with kind of an average duck that, that most people are, are probably fairly familiar with um, just by going to, to you know, local ponds, um, local county parks, city parks. I see them all over, you know, gas stations and things these days. So they're readily available. So most people have a, a basic understanding of what um, a mallard looks like. Um, now I will give a quick warning. Um, we are going to be playing some bird vocalizations throughout this presentation. Uh, so this is just kind of a quick headphone warning. If you are wearing headphones, you may want to turn the volume down until you hear a few of the calls just so you can hear how loud they are. Uh, but we'll go ahead and play the vocalization for the mallard. And so that's probably a call that most people are familiar with. It sounds like your, your textbook kind of duck quack. Um, so mallards are, again, the most harvested duck in Illinois. 
they're also very adaptable. Um, they can, you know, live in a wide range of habitats as well as eat a variety of food sources. And so that kind of makes them very adaptable. And that's one reason why they're so common in Illinois is that they have this, this high, you know, reproductive and survival capacity that some other species don't have. Um, so mallards, we'll, we'll first start off with, with kind of the male mallard. Um, so you can see the male mallard here on the left, um, on the, the two birds sitting on the water. He's got this bright green head. But what I really want to point out about the, the male mallard, if you look at this picture of, of the male in flight, you can see that, that purple kind of tinge and coloration on the wings. Um, it's kind of surrounded by two white bars. That area is what we refer to as the speculum. It's kind of what we just showed a, a few seconds ago. And if you look at these two, two um, mallards sitting on the water, you can see that that speculum isn't necessarily visible 100% of the time. And so that, that's one thing I really like to highlight at the beginning of this webinar is don't focus on just one identifying characteristic. It's kind of using the, the totality of the information. Um, so if you're looking at a duck that, that's coming into your spread and you're trying to identify what species it is, um, first think about the habitat that's there. Think about what the, the silhouette or what the size and the shape of the bird is. Do you hear it calling at all? Um, as you start to waterfall hunt and get more experienced with, with looking at ducks, you'll start to notice that they fly different or that they might flock in, in groups differently. And so it's really using the totality of this information rather than just saying, oh yeah, it's got a green head and a purple speculum, so it's a mallard. It's kind of feeding all this information until you can come up with a collective answer. Um, so don't focus on just one specific identifying characteristic. Try to focus on all of them together. Um, but the mallard, especially the male, are easily characterized by that green head. Again, they're a fairly big body duck and they have wide, flat, and yellow bills. Um, the females do have that blue speculum patch on the wing as well, uh, but typically you're only going to see that when it is in flight, uh, but the females do, do have that, that speculum. Now the females, that's one thing you're, you'll learn throughout this entire webinar and as you continue you know, looking at waterfowl or, or even waterfowl hunting, the females are by far the most difficult um, to identify. And today what we're really gonna be focusing on is the males and we'll go over a few identifying characteristics of the females, uh, but we're really gonna focus on the males since this is just kind of an introductory course. Um, and then we do plan on having a follow-up waterfowl ID where we spend a little bit more time on the females. So, so be on the lookout for that. But essentially that is the mallard. And now we'll move on to my favorite wood duck, or my favorite wood duck, my favorite duck, the wood duck. Um, now, again, I will urge a headphone warning. This is a very high pitched call. Um, so you might wanna turn your volume down for this one, but this is the vocalization of the wood duck. And so you can see if, if, if you didn't know anything about a wood duck and you heard that out in the swamp or out in the lake, your first instinct would probably not be to guess that that is a species of duck. Um, it's got this really unique um, kind of whistling vocalization. I mean, the, the, the real interesting thing about wood ducks is they're one of our, our few cavity nesters. Um, so they will actually nest in Illinois. Um, and if you've been to Illinois DNR sites or even some county sites that have um, some type of, of pond or different waterways, you might see what looks like a birdhouse that's kind of out in the middle of the pond that's maybe, I don't know, a foot and a half to two feet off of the water surface. Um, those are designed for wood ducks. And so they're wood duck nest boxes. And essentially they're used to augment and provide additional cavity nesting opportunities in areas that might not naturally have them. Um, so that is something that you will see uh, fairly commonly throughout the state. But wood ducks are a cool duck on, on many fronts. Um, not only do they have that unique vocalization and the, the kind of cavity nesting, but they're also pretty cool looking and pretty unique shaped. Um, if you look at the silhouette at the bottom right, that really shows kind of this, this crested head that they have. Um, a lot better than the, the picture up top. And you can see they also have a fairly um, kind of thin and smaller bill than some of the other duck species. So if you think back to the mallard that we just discussed, 
where it had this really long, thick, and yellow bill, we have a much thinner um, and narrower, as well as shorter bill on the wood ducks. Now the males are pretty easily identified. Um, they have this real glossy green head that kind of changes colors and translucency depending on how the light might be hitting it. Um, the females are, again, a lot more drab colored. So they're kind of gray brown with this white speckled breast. Uh, but one of the easiest ways to identify a female wood duck is that white eye ring that you can see wrap, kind of wrapping around her eye. And now that might seem like something that, that's really difficult to see, you know, while a bird is in flight. And while that's likely true, typically with, with duck you're going to have multiple together a lot of times. You might have a single male come in at a time or two, uh, but typically if, if you know, especially wood ducks, they're going to come in in pairs or in threes, but that white eye ring on the female stands out a lot more than you think it would. Um, I'm not sure if it's the, the contrast between the, the white and kind of the drab coloration behind it, uh, but it really does pop and gives you a pretty solid identifying characteristic um, for the, the female wood duck. Up next, we have the gadwall. And while that might not sound, that, that's not necessarily the best recording, it was kind of the best one we could find, but a, a gadwall has a a very raspy vocalization. It almost sounds like, like a, a mallard that was at a Motley Crue concert the night before and was just screaming at the entire time. It's got that real raspiness in its, its voice. It still sounds like that normal duck quack, but has a lot more kind of grunge and rasp to it um, as it calls. You'll hear a lot of hunters refer to the gadwall as gray duck. Um, and that's simply because if you look at both the male and the female, they're fairly kind of gray drab ducks. Um, so many people just call them gray ducks. So if you do hear that, um, just know that that is referring to the gadwall. Um, what a lot, when I first started waterfowl hunting, um, one of my um, kind of favorite statements from my grandfather was that if, if you have a duck in front of you and you can't figure out what it is, and it's you know none of the species you've ever seen before, nine times out of 10, it's a gadwall. Um, and that, that's kind of the, the story of these birds is they're, they're not very descript, uh, but once you know what to look for, it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. And it's one of those that I can spot, you know, going down the freeway, um, where even sometimes mallards give me a little more trouble than a gadwall will. In terms of size, they're about the, the same size as a, as, a gab, uh, as a mallard. So they're a fairly robust and heavy duck. They're kind of on the larger side, um, but the males, are again kind of this gray brown but the, the the biggest identifying characteristic is that bright white speculum and so you can see it on both the male and the female um, in the top picture even when they're not in flight that white speculum is still kind of peeking out a little bit um, now looking at this this male that is in flight in the bottom you can see on the top kind of portion of of the speculum it's kind of surrounded by black and so that makes that speculum really pop at a distance. And that's something you can see in flight um, pretty quickly and pretty easily is that that white flashing of the speculum. Um, they also have kind of a kind of a, a, a chocolate cover colored um, shoulder patch right above um, the, the white speculum. But that's something that, that's not really easy to pick up on um, when that bird's in flight. Uh, but that white speculum kind of really sticks out. Um, and you're likely going to find gadwalls right alongside mallards. Um, again, these are dabblers, so they're going to prefer to be in kind of shallower areas. Um, so well-vegetated marshes, farm ponds, um, streams, as well as on bigger bodies of water. But they will most likely be on, on kind of the fringe areas. So in the shallower areas of that bigger reservoir, um, so kind of near the bank, you might find um, some gadwalls kind of mixing in here and there. But typically you're going to find them in dry ag fields or shallower wetland areas. Up next we have the green wing teal.
And so that's another vocalization that if you weren't familiar with duck hunting or, you know, with, with duck behavior and duck calls, I don't know that I would call that a duck the first time I heard it. I would probably think it was a cricket or some kind of little frog, uh, but it's basically this kind of tremolo style whistle. Um, you can just kind of hear that whistle just kind of flipping, flipping. Um, and the nice thing about a green wing teal vocalization is for some reason that specific, I don't know if it's the tonality of the vocalization or the volume or the pitch, but something about their vocalization makes it seem to carry um, a little bit further than some other duck calls. And so you can hear green wing teals fairly regularly from a good distance away. Um, and it's a, a fairly easy call to reproduce as well. And so you'll see a lot of duck callers just kind of carry a random whistle on their duck calls um, and just kind of fluttering your tongue into that whistle, you can start to mimic the green wing teal vocalization. Now these are our smallest duck in North America and in Illinois and they prefer shallow wetlands and flooded fields. Um, the, the real cool behavior about the green wing teal is not only are they tiny and extremely fast flyers, but they have kind of a unique flocking behavior. Um, so we've all seen, you know, mighty ducks and we've all seen that kind of flying V that you expect typical waterfowl to fly in. Um, they kind of have that lead bird with the, the two trailing edges um, coming off it forming a V. Um, teal are a little bit different. If you've seen kind of Star Wars, instead of flying in a V, a lot of times some of the ships will kind of fly in a pod. So you just have this kind of cluster of birds instead of this kind of uniform flying V. And so you just have kind of this cluster of a pod of, you know, 10 to 15 teal just buzzing by really fast. Um, and so they're, they're tricky to hunt, especially as a, as a new hunter. Uh, but the nice thing is they are fairly easy to identify, um, strictly based on the size, the way they fly, and how fast they're flying. Um, can, can give you a pretty solid ID on these guys uh, fairly quickly. But the adult males have kind of this slate colored grayish body um, with a, you can kind of see they have a narrow white stripe almost near their, their shoulder and armpit area. Um, and the, the real cool thing about, I think the males is their head. I mean, I love that, that kind of cinnamon colored head with almost a green Nike style swoop or swoosh um, kind of coming off the back of the head. But you'll also notice they have this really bright green to bluish speculum. Um, both sexes do have that speculum. Um, however, teal seem to, to hide those speculums a little bit more than some other species. Again, that's just my personal experience. Um, but it, it seems like with the green wing teal, it's a little harder to, to see that speculum at times um, when they are just kind of at rest or loafing. Um, but when in flight, that, that green speculum is real flashy and it, it can give you a pretty solid ID, uh, particularly, again, just due to the, the size of the bird, how they're flying. So they're not, again, they're not flying in that V. They're kind of flying in a pod-shaped formation um, as well as just how fast and how small they are. Up next is the close um, relative of the green wing teal, the blue wing teal. And again, that's another vocalization that doesn't necessarily sound like a duck. Um, but the, the blue wing teal are slightly larger than the green wing teal, uh, but they are still a fairly small duck um, in terms of the majority of the other ducks that we're talking about today. Um, so they are a relatively small, small duck. Again, they're still extremely fast flyers and they still kind of fly in that same pod style formation that the green wing teal does. Um, but where I typically find blue wing teal is on bigger bodies of water, um, bigger calm bodies of water. So bigger reservoirs like lakes, um, if a pond gets kind of big enough, um, as well as marshes. And typically they're gonna be on the outskirts of these areas. They're gonna be you know, on the, near the banks and kind of the shallower areas. Um, and particularly in back in, the, in coves that are somewhat blocked from the wind um, is where I, I, I seem to, to find a, a good number of, of blue wing teal. So looking in those coves, 
that are kind of tucked away and out of the wind um, that still can provide them that, that shallow water. Because again, these are still dabblers, so they still need that shallow water um, so that they can feed. Now the males are, they have a, a really unique um, kind of speckling on, on their breast. Um, when I look at it, it almost, it almost looks like kind of noise, like you'd see on a TV or if an image, you know, was, was shot in really low light um, and gets real grainy. It's just got that unique kind of randomness to it. Um, and that, that stands out quite a bit. But what I really want to focus on with the males is that white swoop um, on the side of the face. So they have, again, that kind of grayish blue head with that, that real stark contrasting white um, that, that kind of sits behind the bill. It's kind of, you know, half moon shaped. Um, now the females are a little bit tougher to identify. They don't have that, that same facial marking that the, the males do, but they do have that, that same speculum and shoulder patch that the, the males do. And the nice thing about the, the coloration on the wing of the blue wing teal is you can see how much further it goes up on the, how much further the coloration goes up on the wing. You can see it almost kind of encompasses the whole top side of the wing. And so that makes that color stand out a little bit more, even when they're resting. Um, so even when they're not in flight, you can still see a lot of that shoulder coloration, as well as some of that blue green speculum um, that, that's kind of peeking through there. Up next is the Northern Shoveler. So you can see it's got that real kind of popping um, type call. Um, but the, the dead giveaway um, for the Northern Shoveler, as many of you have probably already noticed, is the size and shape of that that bill. Um, it, it almost looks kind of mutated and kind of ugly, but it, it's almost so ugly it's kind of cute. Um, but a lot of duck hunters just call these spoonies or spoon bills. Um, but the, the correct term is northern shoveler, uh, but you can kind of use those terms any which way. They are a medium-sized duck that again, they are dabblers, so they prefer you know like shallower wetland areas, uh, particularly freshwater marshes um, that kind of have a lot of natural um, food supply. So not necessarily corn or, or, or rice or things like that, but a lot of these just kind of moist soil plants that, that naturally and natively grow in wetlands. Um, that's something that they really thrive in. Now I want to kind of move to the next slide really quick just to, to highlight this bill. Um, so Jason, if you could move to the next slide. Um, and so here's a male northern shoveler. Again, he's a dabbler, so he's in very shallow water but they, they have a, a very unique kind of behavior and adaptation to how they've learned to use that, that oddly shaped bill. Um, so what this male is essentially doing is he's putting his, his giant bill just beneath the, the surface of the mud, and he's essentially just going to shake it back and forth really, really fast. And what that's going to do is release a lot of the seeds and food sources that have been kind of trapped in that that sediment and it's going to release them and then he's going to eat them. And so it, it's kind of this unique behavior that he's just going to sit there in the real shallow water and just wiggle his head back, back and forth really fast and start to, to, to feed that way. And so that is kind of the, the main identifying characteristic of the Northern Shoveler is that kind of uniquely shaped bill. Um, if we go back to the other slide, you can see that even the, the female um, possesses that, that same shaped bill. Um, it's not necessarily this dark black like the males have, uh, but it is still that, that unique shape. And I don't know how many times I've seen northern shovelers flying around. The first thing that your eye goes to every single time you see one is that bill. It's something that really stands out well against the sky, and it's something that your eye just kind of naturally looks at. Um, but outside of the bill, um, there's a lot of other characteristics that make this, this duck fairly easy. Um, to recognize. And a lot of that is, again, it's got this greenish colored head, similar to the mallard, but we know it's not a mallard because of the shape of that bill, as well as kind of the rest of the coloration of that body. Um, so if you look at the, kind of the, the side of the male, it's got this really deep kind of chestnut colored pattern on the side, 
um, that, that's kind of offset by two white sections. And one thing I really like to focus on when I'm trying to, to learn how to identify a new species is look for changes in contrast. Um, particularly because with waterfowl hunting, you're gonna be hunting in a lot of low light areas. Anything that has a lot of contrast, so this brown to white, or even on the wing, you have this really contrasty white triangle that's just kind of punching you in the face between the blue and green. So these contrasting colors really stand out um, from a great distance. So those are things I really try to look for. And this is a really good example, is just looking at the, the, the brown and the white um, along the side there. But if we look closely at their wings, um, you may start to see some similarities from a species that we just talked about a few minutes ago. Um, it's got a very similar wing pattern to the blue winged teal. Um, so it's got kind of this bluish gray shoulder um, with a green speculum. So Jason, if you can go back to the um, blue winged teal for just a second. So you can see that they look somewhat similar if you were just looking at their wings. Uh, but that's why I like to, again, highlight you're not just focused on one specific identifying characteristic. It's focusing on kind of the totality of the information that's in front of you. Um, so that is the northern shoveler. And I will say one thing about these um, northern shovelers. They're a bird that gets a lot of flack from the, the waterfowl community. And I think a lot of it is kind of undeserved. Um, and so if you're having a slow day, a slow, let's say you're having a slow morning and by nine or 10 o'clock, for some reason, northern shovelers seem to be kind of that, that mid-morning moving duck. Um, I have a lot of instances where I don't see a duck all day and then 10 to 11 o'clock, the northern shovelers start funneling into a certain area. Um, so it is something you're gonna see a lot of in Illinois. Um, they're mighty tasty and they're a pretty looking bird and they're, they're fun to hunt. Up next, we have the American Widgeon. As you can see, that's kind of another one of these species that doesn't really sound like a duck. Um, it almost sounds like, you know, somebody kind of scratching a record. It's kind of got that, that same pitch and tone to it. Um, but the American Widgeon is for a lot of for a lot of Illinois hunters, it's kind of the the holy grail. Um, it's one of those that isn't easy to hunt. Um, they're they're very cognizant of humans, and any disturbance or hunting pressure will generally push them out of an area, and they'll find a new area. Um, so they are somewhat difficult to hunt, and they're not the most common duck we have, and they're pretty darn cool looking. Um, so for a lot of hunters, this is kind of the the holy grail or that that trophy species that they want to get you know, one of before they, before they hang it up for, for life. Um, but the American widgeon is, is a really cool bird. Um, again, they're, they're very shy. And this is one of those species that if I happen to, to stumble across a flock of American widgeon when I'm scouting, um, I'm going to change a lot of my tactics to how I hunt that specific area because they're so, so nervous about hunting pressure and about people. Um, it's not one of those that you can go, you know, mallards or gadwalls or some of the other ducks that we've talked about. You can push them out of an area, go set up your equipment, and probably hunt the next day. Um, American widgeons, if you try that, they're gone. They're going to be on a different lake, probably in a different county. They really like to be away from people and away from any noises and things like that. So they are fairly tough to hunt. But that makes them pretty easy to identify because it's something that you don't see very often. Um, so when you do see it, oh, it's a widgeon. Um, but they have this uh, really pretty kind of green swoop on the side of the face. Um, and they have this very powdery blue bill. And if we think back to the contrast kind of tip I mentioned a few minutes ago, that bill has some pretty stark in contrast. It's got that black kind of outline that goes over basically the entire bill. Um, so it's kind of this grayish blue that's got a complete black outline around it. Uh, but what I like to focus on, in addition to the, the green head swoop, is that, that white shoulder patch above the speculum. 
Um, that's something that you normally don't see on a lot of other bird species is white above the speculum. Um, and so that's a really good identifying characteristic for, um, for the American widgeon. Up next, we have the Northern Pintail. And I think this is one of the, the easier ducks in Illinois or in North America to identify is the northern pintail. Um, you're going to see a lot of them, especially if you're in areas where um, you're getting a lot of frequent mallards. Um, they typically like to spend a lot of time and inhabit the same areas as mallards. And so if you have an area that's, you know, got a ton of mallards coming in, you're likely going to run into a bunch of pintails as well. They are kind of on, you know, the, the medium-sized duck. They're not a particularly small duck or a particularly big duck, but there's one characteristic that you look at one time and you're going to remember it, um, and that is the long, slender neck um, that, that northern pintails have. Uh, both the males and the females have that long, slender neck, um, as well as those real punchy kind of contrasting colors along the neck of the male. Again, I like I mentioned I like to look at contrast and that dark head with that white neck is a huge, 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 just kind of beacon of contrast that, that really stands out um, from a long ways away. Now the Northern Pintail gets its name, obviously from its pin shaped tail. So if you look at this picture of the, the male sitting in the water, you can see that, that, real, slow, that real long and slender tail um, that no other duck species has that you'll commonly see in Illinois. Um, there are a few whistling duck species like the long-tailed whistling duck um, that has a tail similar to this, but overall they look completely different. Um, so just focus on the neck and the tail and you'll get a pretty easily identified um, northern pintail. Now it's hard to see in this specific picture, but they do have a dark green speculum that's got kind of a white bar on the bottom and kind of this tan orangish colored at the top. Um, that green is a very dark green and it's something, if it's overcast, you're not going to see much coloration out of that speculum. Um, you might pick up a little, a little green, but I would say most often um, in overcast, it's going to look dark. Um, so unless you have kind of bright sun on that bird, it's, it's pretty difficult to see the specific colors. Um, and that's why I'm really focused on the neck and kind of the overall shape of the, the northern pintail. So now we're gonna move into the diving ducks. And I will say, um, this is where duck ID gets a little bit more difficult. Um, so you've noticed a lot of the species we've discussed so far have you know, fairly flamboyant colors, uh, particularly the males. Um, what you're gonna see with diving ducks, a lot of people just call these the black and white ducks because um, a lot of them are just black and white and different variations of that specific pattern. Um, so it can get a little challenging when you start um, thinking about diving ducks. But first things first, we will start with the ring-necked. Now obviously there's a, a random Canada goose in the background there, but you can hear that it sounds a lot more like your typical duck than some of the other dabblers that we've talked about. Um, and the ring neck duck is the, the diving duck that is most likely to be found in shallower areas. Um, you can occasionally find them right alongside of, of dabbling ducks in some of these shallower wetlands, but you can also find them in deeper water. Um, so they kind of, you know, will kind of go back and forth between dabblers and divers. Um, but I think whoever named the ring neck duck should be kind of ridiculed by public shaming. Um, there's not really a ring around the neck of this duck. I personally, the way I remember this duck is I call it the ring build duck. Um, cause if you look at the male and the female, they both have rings around the bill. And while again, that might seem like it's minor detail that you're not going to see from a far way away that contrast between the dark bill and those white bands really help it stick out. 
Um, now there is a very subtle ring around the neck, uh, but it's something that you're never going to see until that bird is basically in your hand. Um, it's this very faint, uh, basically crimson red collar around the neck. Uh, but again, you're never going to see it when it's in flight or just kind of sitting on the water. It's one of those things that you can only see it when it's up close. So I like to think of this as the ring necked or the ring billed duck. Um, and that, that gives you a lot greater chance of getting a successful ID. Um, but the males are pretty standard diving duck. Um, so they're just going to be kind of black and gray with a dark head. Um, but one thing I really want to point out is the black back. Um, now that's not going to mean much to you right now, but it will once we move on to a few other species that look somewhat similar, but don't have a black back. So the ring necked duck has those rings around the bill and this black back. And you can also see the, the black back on the side, on the back of the female, as well as she has those same rings around the bill. So now if we look at the lesser scop, you can see before we play the vocalization, I just want to go back and forth for a few. Um, so if you look at the side and the back of the scop, you can see it's white on the side and kind of this gray patterned color on the back. Now if we go back to the ring necked, you can see we have this black back. And so that gives you a really solid ID that you can see from a long way away. Do you see a black back? Okay. Ring necked. See a gray back? Okay. Scop. Um, but before we move on too much with the scop, I will mention um, there are two species of scop um, that are commonly found in Illinois. That is the greater scop and the lesser scop. Now, if you look at the regulations, you do not have to be able to differentiate between the greater and lesser. Um, there's a lot of crossover, there's a lot of variation, and so they don't make hunters do that. You just need to be able to identify that it is a scop, um, and that is sufficient for the state and the feds. Um, but just make sure that you know that there are two species. Um, and the way you identify the two species is essentially the amount of white on the wing feathers. Um, so if you look at this uh, male scop that's in flight in the bottom, you can see that that white speculum only goes up about halfway up that wing. On the greater scop, there is a lot more white that, that kind of travels further up the wing. And so there's a lot of, you know, variation there between the two. And so for us as hunters, we just need to be able to identify that it is a scop. Uh, but now we will play the vocalization. So again, that's another vocalization that doesn't necessarily sound like a duck. Um, but the scop, you will also hear people call these blue bills. Um, there's a lot of hunters that will call these blue bills, and that's due to that bluish gray bill um, that both the males and the females possess. The males and the females also have a nice bright yellow eye. Um, not something you're necessarily going to see you know, when you're hunting, uh, but it is kind of interesting to note that they do have bright yellow eyes. But the big thing to focus on for the scalp is the color of that bill, so that grayish blue, the color of the head of the male, so that kind of greenish, dark, let's call it dark green, and then the color of that back. So it's got that kind of gray mottled patternation um, rather than the ring neck that basically had that solid black back um, with a kind of white adjacent side. Here we have that mottled coloration on the back with that white adjacent side. And so focusing on the color and the pattern of that back uh, can help you differentiate between the scalp and the ring neck. Up next, we have the buffle head. And so these are one of our, in my opinion, one of the cooler looking diving ducks. Um, if, if you think back to what the northern pintail looked like, this almost looks like the complete opposite of the northern pintail. Um, instead of being kind of a long slender duck, this is a very small and thick and compact duck. Um, I almost like to, to think of it as kind of a, a butterball with wings. 
Um, there's basically no neck there. It just goes head to, to breast and it's just a really thick duck. Uh, but the males are pretty easily identifiable. Um, they're gonna be mostly white um, with the black back. Uh, but when they're in the water, you're pretty much only gonna see white and then a black back. And you can notice this really big white patch on the back of the heads of the males. Um, that's something you'll see from God, four or 500 yards away sometimes if you have binoculars. It's that contrast just really stands out. Um, and if the light is hitting it just right, you can start to pick up on some colors um, in the face. And so you can see, I think, yeah, you can kind of see some of the, the colors that are starting to pop um, on the, the face of that male in these two pictures. So you get kind of that chameleon style effect that kind of the color changes depending on the way the light hits it and the way your eyes are looking at it. Uh, but the, the dead giveaway for the males is that big white patch that kind of wraps around the back of the head. Now the females have a much smaller white patch, uh, but it is still present. Um, so it's kind of this smeared kind of white patch along the side of the cheek. And now we have the common golden eye. But before we play the vocalization, I want you to focus on that, that white spot on the male, that, that white circle right on the cheek. If we go back to the previous image really quick, um, I have personally had a few instances where I thought it was a female bufflehead and it ended up being a golden eye or vice versa. So the way I like to remember it is it's essential, a female bufflehead is like a golden eye that's been smeared. Um, so it's kind of got that, that's what looked like a circular shape and then it kind of smeared. Now, if you go back to the golden eye, it's gonna be a very perfect circle. Um, now we will play the vocalization for the common golden eye. And so this is the, the common golden eye. Um, there are two different species of golden eye that you'll commonly see in, not commonly, that can be found in Illinois. Um, this is the common golden eye. There's also the barrows, B-A-R-R-O-W-S, golden eye. Um, essentially, it looks identical to the common golden eye, except the shape of that white eye patch is not perfectly circular. Um, it's more octagon shaped. Um, there are a few that are harvested every year, uh, but the majority of them are just going to be common golden eyes. Um, so they're kind of, again, a medium-sized duck. But what I like to point out is kind of the shape of their head. It's, it, it almost looks like their head is too big for their neck. Um, and that's something that, that carries pretty well among golden eyes. And you'll, you'll start to pick up on that the more you see um, out as you're hunting or looking at birds. Uh, but the males, again, they're going to appear mostly black and white, just like the majority of diving ducks. Um, that back is kind of jet black, just like the back of the ringnecked. Um, and it's still got those kind of white flanking sides. Uh, but the big giveaway on the golden eye is just that white um, eye patch or white cheek patch, as well as the shape of the head. Um, so once you start looking at these a little bit more, the shape and the size of that head will really stand out. Um, the females, I, I really struggle identifying these females um, until they're kind of up close and, and basically in your face. Uh, but the, the nice thing, again, is just the shape of the head. Um, that can give away a, a female golden eye. Now we're going to transition to a few more diving duck species that actually have a little color. Um, so this is the redhead. So they're a medium sized duck. Again, they are a diving duck, so they're going to prefer the large lakes and reservoirs. Um, they're extremely social and so you'll you'll find redheads kind of mixed in with with other species at times. Um, now before you you think that this will be kind of the easiest one to identify, um, there is another duck that looks fairly similar that we'll get to next, but what I want to point out on the redhead is obviously the, the color of that head, but also the bill. Um, so you can see the bill is basically kind of a, a grayish blue with a black tip. Now, if we move to the next species, which is the canvas back, 
It also has a red head, but it has a solid black bill. So now if we go back to redhead, I also want you to look not necessarily the color of the bill, but also the shape of that bill. Um, so you can see how this is kind of a much flatter, more standard duck bill, where if we go back to the shove, to the canvas back, you can see it's a much bigger bill, similar to that of a shoveler. It's one of those that just stands out. And I also want you to, to look at the, the way that that bill slopes off of the forehead. Um, like you can see Jason basically moving his cursor right along that slope. It's basically a straight line from the top of the forehead down to the tip of the bill, where if we look at the red head, we can go back. Yep, the red head, you can see you have that sloping shape. And while again, that might seem like, oh, you're not gonna see that. The shape of that canvas back bill is something that you'll see once and you'll never forget it. Um, it's a big, dark black bill. But back to the red head, um, you can see they have this real bright uh, kind of cinnamon colored head. And one thing I want to point out is that the redhead's coloration is, I like to think of it as more, it's more of a, a classy duck. Um, so the color is very vibrant and pops, where if you look at the um, canvas back, it's almost kind of a muddied version of that same color. It's not necessarily as clean or as precise. Um, so that is the redhead. So like I just mentioned with the canvas back, if you look at the kind of the, the color of that head, you can see it's, it's got kind of black splotchiness kind of moving throughout, and it's just kind of a, a, a duller and kind of more muddier color than that of the red head. Um, the canvas back also has red eyes on the male, uh, but the, the dead giveaway for both a male and female canvas back is the size, the shape, and kind of the slope, the sloping nature of that bill. Uh, but we'll go ahead and play the vocalization for the canvas back. So canvas backs are, are kind of a, a unique duck in that they've been in the news for the past couple years. Um, they're There we go. Um, their, their population status has, has fluctuated a few years. Um, so, you know, back when I first started waterfowl hunting, you couldn't even harvest a canvas back. It was kind of illegal because there were so few left. Um, now you can harvest one. Um, some years it's two. So it just kind of goes back and forth. But it's kind of one of those, you know, kind of conservation success stories um, that, that really shows that adjusting bag limits really pays off in terms of maintaining these sustainable populations. Uh, but again, they're a large, big-headed duck. Um, you're going to see them fairly regularly on large, open bodies of water. Um, the only thing you're likely going to get them confused with is a redhead, but just focus on the shape and the size of that bill, um, and you'll have a, a positive ID pretty easily. Up next is the ruddy duck. And before we play the vocalization, I want you to look at the, the male that is sitting here at the top of the water. You can see that essentially he's sitting there with his tail straight up in the air. Um, no other ducks do that, that I know of. None of the other ones that we've covered in this presentation. But when you hear the vocalization that, when, that we're going to play, um, that is essentially the mating ritual of the male ruddy duck. And what you're seeing is kind of that display as well. So he's gonna stick that tail straight up in the air and just kind of wag it back and forth really, really fast as he's making this uh, vocalization. So these are very kind of thick necked compact ducks, very similar to the buffleheads. Um, again, they are diving, so you're likely going to find them on large rivers, ponds, and lakes. And the, the sad thing about ruddy ducks is by the time that they get to Illinois, they're not in this pretty breeding plumage that you see it in kind of the top. Um, you're a lot more likely to see a ruddy duck that kind of looks like the one in the bottom um, or even a lot more kind of drab colored gray. Uh, but the, the easiest way to identify a ruddy duck is just the overall size. Um, 
it's very similar to a buffalo head. Again, you're going to find it mixed with buffalo heads and golden eyes very regularly. But the color of the bill of the male, um, it's this really bright, beautiful sky blue. Um, and it's got kind of a, a black head with these white cheek patches on either side of the face um, that really offset kind of that overall chocolate crimson colored, basically rest of the body. Um, but in the winter, again, they are going to be a lot more dull gray brown. Um, so they're going to lose a lot of that breeding plumage. They're not going to be near as vibrant and pretty as they are here. And so what I really like to focus on for the ruddy ducks is the pattern on the face. Um, looking at the, the black and the white contrast with that really beautiful kind of sky blue um, bill. Now the females, like you can see in this picture up at the top, um, they have white patches on the side of the face, just like the males. However, instead of having this one solid line, they almost have two blurry lines. Um, and what I mean by blurry is they don't have that, that uniform kind of, like if, if you look at the male, there's really strong contrast between the dark areas and the white areas. On the female, those two white stripes, there's not a huge contrast between those and the rest of the head. And so I kind of view them as sort of blurry lines, so to speak. Now the last of kind of the, the diving ducks, so to speak, are the mergansers. Um, so we have three mergansers in Illinois. Um, we have the common merganser, the hooded merganser, and the red-breasted merganser. And these are essentially the fish ducks um, for what a lot of people call them. If you look at this bottom picture, you can see that it almost looks like they have teeth. Um, and while, not, while we know that birds don't have teeth, these are essentially tooth-like plates and they serve the same purpose as teeth. And you can see that the way they're oriented, they're almost oriented, orientated to act as hooks. And so they're really good at grabbing and holding on to fish. And so mergansers primarily are feeding on fish. And so they evolved to have this very slender, thin bell or thin bill that essentially has kind of these tooth-like plates that are used to hold their prey so that they can eat them. Um, the hooded merganser is fairly easy to identify once you start looking at them a little bit. Um, again, they're pretty much a bird that is like 100% contrast. It's just black to white to black to white to a light brown back to black to white. Um, so they're pretty easy to spot from a long distance away, especially when they have that, that hood flared up that you see there in the, on the male. Now the common merganser and the red breasted look very, very similar. Um, the, the common merganser has a white breast where the red breasted, as you can see in this picture, has this kind of reddish, orange, blackish breast. Another bird that you're likely going to see a lot from a duck blind is the American coot. Um, this is not technically considered a duck. It is classified in the rail family, um, but it can be legally harvested during duck season. And it's something that you're gonna see a lot from the duck blind. Um, so it's basically an overall jet black bird with a white bill. Um, and they are the exact opposite of the American widgeon and the fact that you can scare them off and they'll be right back where they were five minutes later. Um, they're, they're not a very secluded species. They don't seem to be disturbed by hunting pressure too much. And so you're likely gonna see these a lot um, out in the duck blind. And again, check your regulations, but they are legal to harvest during um, duck season. And we'll kind of keep moving right along and notice we're running a little short on time, uh, but we'll get to geese and we'll address any questions we have kind of at the very end when we open it up for question and answers. Um, so we're gonna start covering geese. Um, now, most people are probably familiar with the Canada goose, uh, but there's several other species of geese that you need to be familiar with. Um, so first we'll start off with the one everybody's familiar with, the Canada goose. Not much to say about this. I think everyone knows what they sound like and what they look like. Uh, but we'll go ahead and play that vocalization really quick. So that is the Canada goose. But one thing I want to point out about the Canada goose is that there's essentially two populations of Canada geese. 
um, that spend time in Illinois. Um, if you can advance to the next slide, Jason. Thank you. And so we have these two populations. We essentially have this migratory population that migrates through every year, um, just like other songbirds and other ducks. But we also have this resident population. And so these are the Canada geese that most people are probably familiar with. Um, they're the geese that are in your HOA ponds, at your Walmart, in your shopping centers, on top of your uh, business. And now that resident population is increasing. Um, it, it's kind of stabilized the past few years, but the, the overall seven-year average trends still show it that it's, it's somewhat increasing, um, where the migratory population is much more stable. And so what I want to point out here is that there are multiple Canada goose seasons, and they are essentially designed to hunt the resident population, and then the other season is designed to hunt the migratory population. And so there are some regulatory differences um, that, that you need to be aware of if you do plan on trying to hunt this resident population. Um, that is the early goose hunt or the early goose season. It's typically September 1st um, for a few weeks. Um, and the main goal of that season is again, that population is increasing, it's causing a lot of issues. And so it's bringing that population down to a more manageable level. And so here's kind of a quick illustration that shows how much the, these resident geese have kind of increased over the past couple decades. Um, you can see that it's a, a, a pretty drastic increase um, in the number of resident Canada geese. And so there's a lot of issues that arise with nuisance wildlife, especially at a scale like this. And you know, we've, as a society and as a community, we've basically created the ideal goose habitat just through urbanization. Um, they really like your manicured parks. If you have an HOA pond and the mowed grass basically goes all the way up to the water, um, that is ideal, ideal, ideal habitat for geese. And so through a lot of this urbanization, we've basically created and managed ideal goose habitat. Um, another a kind of factor at play is that they have a strong tendency to return to the same area year after year, uh, especially if they've actively and successfully nested in a specific site, um, they're likely to nest there that next year. And their young that were born at that site are likely to return to that same site and try to have their own successful nests. Um, so you can see it's kind of this exponential type growth um, that can occur. And there was actually a study, I believe it was three years ago out of the University of Tennessee, uh, but they had a, a local HOA pond that had a huge overabundant population of Canada geese. Um, so they went in, removed these Canada geese. I think they took them over 200 miles. They banded them and released them. And within two weeks, they were back at that original HOA pond. Um, and so they really have that strong tendency to return to the same spot. Obviously, with this number of, of birds, there's going to be large amounts of excrement, and eventually you're going to have damage to landscaping that can be um, fairly expensive. And so we've all seen kind of issues and, and, and pictures that, that illustrate this point. Um, so here's just a, a quick couple of examples to kind of break up the presentation. Um, they're very territorial, especially when they're nesting, um, and they create a lot of human and wildlife conflicts. But up next is the snow goose. And one thing I, I really want to point out with the snow goose is that the, the birds you're seeing right there, just as kind of the, the PowerPoint shows, is the exact same species. Um, they can be this jet white snow goose, or they can be what a lot of people refer to as a blue morph or a blue goose even though they're technically the, a snow goose, a lot of hunters call them kind of blue goose. But they can either be, again, that jet white, that dark blue, or any pattern in between. And so there's a lot of variability in the way that snow gooses can be colored. Uh, but once you start to, to know what to look for, they're fairly easy to identify. Um, snow geese are about the most social bird that we probably have. Um, they 
oftentimes are in flocks of, you know, sometimes five to 10 to 20 to 30,000 at a time. Um, very rarely do you see just one or two snow geese. And so it's pretty easy to get a positive ID. Um, but the big thing to remember about the snow geese is they can be any coloration of these two and they have black tips at the end of their wings. And we'll show you a few pictures later on that kind of illustrate that point. Uh, but just remember they have black tips at the end of their wings. Now, just like the Canada geese, um, snow geese are also uh, fairly overpopulated and have caused a lot of issues the past uh, couple of decades. And so this uh, picture here on the right is a research project that was completed at the, the basically tundra habitat in the Hudson Bay. And so they essentially netted off a specific area of the habitat that these snow geese did not have the ability to, to basically eat out of. And so you can see after the snow geese flocks have naturally hit this area, I mean, they have just decimated and decimated every single piece of vegetation that's outside. And so it gives a real stark comparison of, you know, what it should like, should look like versus what it looks like now. And so we're seeing a lot of issues start to arise um, as this population continues to increase. Um, so a few years, I think it was about 20 years ago at this point, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a conservation order, and that essentially created a spring snow goose hunt. Um, and again, with that, that hunt, um, a lot of the other regulations that apply um, during typical waterfowl season do not apply here. And because that is, you know, the reason is they're trying to reduce this population. And so giving hunters every advantage to maximize harvest is important. Um, it, it can be a very fun hunt, but it can be very challenging. Um, it can be somewhat expensive uh, because, again, a lot of times you're, you know, trying to call or trying to, to bring in, you know, five to 10,000 birds. And that's a lot of eyes looking at you. And if you only have, you know, 24 or 36 decoys, it's going to be tough to pull them in. Um, so a lot of times people who hunt snow geese um, typically go through outfitters because those outfitters are going to have thousands of decoys already, you know, in reserve and set up. And that way you just kind of show up and hunt the field. Up next is my favorite goose. Um, this is the greater white fronted goose. Um, or kind of more colloquially, um, it's referred to as the speckled belly. <coughs> and so it, it kind of sounds just like your standard goose call, um, but this uh, speckled belly is pretty easily identifiable and that's the nice thing about geese in general. Um, they're pretty easy, easy to identify. Um, the speckle belly, again, they're mostly grayish brown. Uh, but what really sets them apart is this kind of barred-like pattern on the breasts. Um, again, I really like to point out contrast because contrast stands out in the field. And those black bars really, really, really stand out in the field. Up next, we have the Ross's goose. Um, this is very similar to the snow goose, which is, happens to be standing right next to this one. Um, so on the left, we have a Ross's goose, and on the right, we have a snow goose. Um, the Ross's goose look almost identical um, to a snow goose, except they have a much shorter bill. And there are a few other morphological differences in the bill that you could see once it's kind of in your hand. Uh, but the Easiest way to identify, I shouldn't even say easy, it's darn near impossible if you don't have them next to each other, um, but it's the, the size of the bill um, that dictates that it's a Ross versus a snow goose. Um, they sound exactly the same as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam We're going to go over the waterfowl identification quiz. So uh, I think Jason is going to give you about 10 seconds. Just a second, Adam. Oh. Um, I just launched the poll, so you should see it pop up on your device now. 
um, yep. and we'll kind of go through these questions and, and answer them. And then the, the, what we're really trying to do here is just kind of get you to think critically and then we can go back after and discuss um, what, basically what you thought the bird was and kind of why, and we can go from there. Yes. So I think Jason is going to give you about um, 10 seconds per slide. So if we could go to the first one, there's your number one. So just whenever you guys are comfortable with your answer, press submit and we'll go on to the next one. Number two. Number three now. Number four. Oh, um, number five. Number six. Number seven. Number eight. Number nine is another call. And finally, number 10. All right, we got everyone's answers in. For number one, oh, can we share the results? There we go. Can everyone see that? Number one, uh, most of you guys got mallard. That is correct. Uh, the reason why it's not a shoveler, again, is the beak. You guys can see this one has a yellow beak. Shovelers have black ones, um, and they look kind of like a, a spoon. Number two, um, mixed bag here. This is a hen mallard. A lot of you guys put gadwall. Uh, it is a mallard. Um, again, and I, I'll go ahead. I put this one in as kind of a trick um, just to show you how difficult, especially females, are when you can't see that speculum. Um, and now you can kind of see if you squint your eyes, you can see that, that white patch. And just beneath that would be that blue speculum. Um, so this one is a, a little tougher, uh, but it is a hen mallard. Number three, most of you guys answered scop. Um, that is correct. What's your scop? Most of you guys did answer green green teal. Uh, it can be similar to a wood duck, though. That I can see how you guys got that one uh, mixed up. A little bit similar. Dan, do you know how? best way to explain how to be able to tell apart the the calls yeah. there um that, that the green wing teal is one that you're going to hear a lot um especially when you're out there and you're going to hear a lot of other hunters using it um there actually is an early teal season as well and so it's a great opportunity it's before because that's the one challenging thing about teal right is they migrate through illinois a lot earlier than most other duck species 
And so they have to have, you know, a season earlier in the year. So September um, is when you can begin early teal hunting. And so that's a great opportunity. And I would encourage a lot of people to um, join a Ducks Unlimited chapter or Delta Waterfowl and try to put together an early teal hunt uh, because it's one of those things that you just have to experience. Um, but the green winged teal, again, it's got that cricket like whistle. Um, the wood duck has a much higher pitched kind of single note that carries. So it's got the whoop, instead of that rapid rolling that you hear in the green winged teal. Um, and the blue winged teal kind of has kind of, it sounds like a squeaky wheel almost. Um, but this is the green winged teal. Great. Thank you. And for number five, uh, I believe four of you guys answered ring neck duck. That is correct. Um, one person answered scop. It is a black and white duck. So I can see how you got that one uh, turned around there, but you guys can see that white bill or the white ring around the bill. Um, so just remember ring around the bill is ring necked duck. Number six, that is a speckled belly goose. Again, you have the specks on the front of the breast right there. Kind of that uh, tannish grayish color. Um, pretty easy to identify right there. And for those who guessed the Ross's goose, just remember the Ross's goose looks almost identifiable to the, um, or identical to the snow goose. Number seven, green winged teal. All of you guys got that one right. Good job. Number eight. Now this is the shoveler. If you guys can see now again, it does have a green head like a mallard, but you can see that spoon build right there, the, the shape of the beak, like a little uh, shovel. So now this is a wood duck call. And then for the last one, it is Gadwall. And so I see we have a couple people who, who guessed canvas back. Um, remember the canvas back is a diving duck. So it's mostly black and white with that um, kind of red head colored head. So it's got that real dark, rusty, chocolatey brown head. And then it's got that really big and solid black bill. Great, good job on the first set. I believe we have, do we have another set of questions? I believe. There we go, 11 through 20. So number 11 right now, next quiz. Number 12. And if you're having trouble at this stage, think about whether it's a diving duck or a dabbling duck first. And that can really start to help you pinpoint what species is, are left. Number 13, number three. Number four. Number five right there. Number six. Number seven. Number eight. Number nine. I believe that is the last one. All right. 
I believe everyone is in. So for the first one, oh, let's share the results. There we go. So this one is a wood duck. Um, yeah, the, the redhead, remember, is a diving duck that is mostly a black and white duck with a red head. Um, and the harlequin duck is not native to Illinois. It's one of those I put in there just because um, it's, we haven't showed it in this presentation either, but it does have kind of a, a similar coloration and pattern to this. Um, it is a very pretty duck, uh, but we do not get harlequins very regularly in Illinois. There's a, occasionally we'll get one that gets lost, uh, but they're mostly bluish ducks as opposed to this kind of normal wood duck pattern you see here. Number two, that is a redhead. All of you guys got that one right. Good job. Number three, that is a canvas back. So again, if we could go back to the last picture, you guys can see the differences between a redhead and a canvas back. Again, canvas back has the full black bill. This one has that kind of a powdery blue. And the canvas back does have a much darker, uh, as Dan said, chocolate kind of head color to it. Bonus uh, point because there is a Ross's goose in there as well. At the very end of the line is actually a Ross. So those are both technically correct. Good job there. Number five. That is a mouth. Again, the wood duck call is more of a whistle. Uh, so for number six, all of you guys got that right. Very good. Pintail. Number seven. That is a buffle head. And for those who guessed hooded merganser, um, that's actually a really good guess, especially if you're just looking at kind of the colors and the pattern. Um, but one thing I want to point out about, you know, a buffle head versus a hooded merganser, a hooded merganser is a much skinnier, and longer duck and remember it has that that it's a fish duck so it has that merganser style bill and so it's not going to have kind of this short stubby fat bill it's going to have a long cylinder like bill um, and the the white spot on the head is not actually on the head it's actually on kind of a, a projected fan almost behind the head that kind of sits on top Number eight, that is a golden eye. Good job, you guys got all that right. And then the last one is a red-breasted merganser. So again, the American coot would be all black, jet blackbird, um, no coloration on it at all. You guys did very good. Well, uh, with that, that is kind of the conclusion of our webinar. Um, I will turn it over to Jason in just a second. He'll kind of wrap things up. Uh, but I do want to highlight if you are, you know, here to learn waterfowl ID, we actually have a waterfowl hunting 101 class on Thursday. Um, so if you're looking to, to kind of take the next step and, and learn some of the more regulations, learn how to, to you know, utilize different uh, decoy strategy placements as well as how to play the wind and a lot of the, the more hands-on aspects of hunting, of waterfowl hunting, um, I highly recommend either registering for that um, or looking into it and seeing if it's something that you're interested in. But with that, I'll turn it over to Jason. Sure. Thanks a lot, Dan. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, we do have time for a Q&A. So if you have any questions, you guys can put that in the chat and we can get to that in a second. Um, so uh, yeah, so just as Dan said, we have waterfowl hunting coming up. Um, this could be useful. All these tactics could be used for photography or for bird watching as well. So if you're not in the hunting camp and you're just enjoying uh, viewing your waterfowl, then that's some more tactics you can learn taking the waterfowl hunting course. Um, and then uh, we have a small game course coming up on June 23rd, and then some deer scouting tactics on June 25th, followed by our deer hunting 102 course. Um, and that one goes more, uh, less regulation in that one and much more uh, talking about different um, scents and tracking a deer and gutting a deer and uh, what to do after the process of getting your deer. So that follows up our 101 course that we've been doing the past couple months. 
Um, if you guys have not been to our website, uh, we do have some modules that you can take on there at your own pace. They're very similar to the webinar information. Um, you don't get to ask it questions, but you can always email us questions after you take it if you have any. And we do have one on waterfowl hunting, uh, deer hunting, turkey hunting, and then upland hunting 101 as well. Uh, we also have Facebook and Instagram if you want to follow that. We always post any new uh, news that's coming out. We upload that if it's relevant to any hunters in Illinois. So it's a good reference for that. We also update our webinars and hopefully eventually we'll get back to doing workshops and we'll upload our schedule to that as well. So please follow with that and um, maybe hopefully sometime we'll get back out and do more of this hands-on stuff which is what we used to do traditionally. Um, and then uh, again, we will be sending out a survey to ask you guys how you enjoyed this course. So please let us know how it went. Um, and I believe that covers most of the bases. So with that, if you guys have any questions for Dan, please go ahead and put that in the chat. And if not, you guys have a fantastic evening. Oh, I thought of something. We will be sending you a recording of this. And if we haven't already, we will send you a PowerPoint uh, that we went through already tonight. So you will have that uh, at your disposal. Um, it will be a private YouTube uh, link. So you can use that at any time you want to go back and rewatch this if you ever want to. And that goes for any other webinars that we've been doing. Uh, we do offer that. So if you want to register, you will be able to get uh, the link to that.